1057 is whenever we got more information as far as Cross Guild. So let's talk about that. Yo, for, to start off, Buggy? I'm not going to say he has like a luck luck fruit or anything like that. But the way things just go around his life to where he, he damn near in a near death situation every other minute. And it just finds a way to compliment him. We got to give him his props. And I say it all the time, I say on the podcast, for anybody that really doesn't know Buggy, but they only know his status and name, he must be terrifying. But seeing him like begging for his life, Mihawk and Crocodile just like, yo, how did you put us in this situation? I found it hilarious. And going to the fact that, you know, the fact that Buggy owed Crocodile money. Didn't pay him. So Crocodile having to hunt him down. And at the same time, that's when the Marines were trying to get Buggy. So it appeared like, oh, you know, Crocodile saving Buggy. And then Crocodile recruiting Mihawk. They doing their thing to get this all together. And it was supposed to be Mihawk and Crocodile, you know, being bigger than Buggy in the poster. And the fact that Buggy looked like he runs stuff, like he the Yonko. Well, he is technically the Yonko. I just... Great job, Oda. The way this is all done with a comedic sense, it just, the payoff is there, but you can still feel the presence. Love the fact that Mihawk, you know, he's someone that is a lot more laid back. He's just like, eh, you know, at the end, this works out for me because I ain't trying, I ain't trying to deal with all that noise that comes with being a Yonko. Crocodile, he mad, but he gonna make it work. A couple things to note about 1057. This is like the most we've seen of Mihawk in years. In years, especially with the previous chapter. Like the fact we got so much interaction between Mihawk, Crocodile, and Buggy, this felt like their own chapter to a point. I was like, man, can we have a little spinoff real quick? Can we go with the next couple of chapters with just them? Can we? And going from there, that was just like, these, these chapters can't, they can't get one upped anymore. Like, how can, how can we get any better from here? Of course, it's going to get better. And I believe 1058. If I'm right, I might be losing track of my numbers here, but I believe after that, that was when we got the one and only Blackbeard coming back. So to go back, to go into that whole thing, Blackbeard wanting to get the devil fruit from, what's her name? Boa Hancock. Wanting to get her devil fruit. He sees the value in her devil fruit. Which, you know, all of us, we were having all these theories about how Blackbeard is going to get this fruit, that fruit. But Boa Hancock being a fruit that's like, yo, we know it's overpowered, but it really is overpowered. Like, it's crazy how, how important, or not important, you know, turning anybody to stone. So we got Blackbeard going in to attack. We also got Kobe that's attempting to arrest Hancock. I, yo, these Marines, they got... They got balls. They got more. They got balls for the fact that they could get an order saying, hey, go capture Luffy. And they just going to be like, all right, cool. This reminds me was the R RDC World skit, the Yakatsuki skit, where it was like your first day in the Yakatsuki. All right, go secure the Nine Tails. It's like, oh, Nine Tails? Yeah, he's in a hidden leaf village. Well, I know where he's at, but the Nine Tails can't. Wait. This is the kind of energy I'm getting from here. Oh, man, but to speed it up. Kobe, of course, trying to get Hancock. We get surprised with Blackbeard making his presence known. And then we also come to find out the whole reason the island's getting destroyed because we seen like these little kids is the, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I'm just going to say these PX bottles of Mihawk and Boa Hancock. The Mihawk one literally slashing the island, slashing a chunk of the mountain. And even forcing, you know, when it started fighting against Blackbeard, even forcing Blackbeard to use some hockey, a couple important things to note about this. Number one, I'm happy that Blackbeard shows that he's able to use hockey. It would have been a, a bit weird to have Blackbeard last this long, even though he does have two of the most, even though he does have two of the most overpowered fruits. I, I still feel like hockey needs to be something at a basic level Blackbeard's capable of. And he is, so that's good to see. But the fact he sort of, no, actually, let me not emphasize the fact he sort of freaked out because Blackbeard be freaking out about everything. But the fact that it was a bit of a concern and that he didn't destroy the pacifist though, completely. Things are getting, finally, it feels like the Marines have some leverage because things are getting intense. The Marines finally feel like a threat again because for a while, it's been feeling like they're punching back. Like Akainu, everybody else, I mean, yeah, they're strong, but y'all been catching L after L after L. 
So then we get into this moment where Boa Hancock just turns a bunch of the soldiers to stone to a Blackbeard's, a bunch of Kobe's. And then Blackbeard's talking to Kobe like, hey, man, what do I do? Like, And it's, it's genuinely funny because it's like a moment where it's just intense action. Who's going to die? What's going to go on? And then we get to a moment where, yeah, so my crewmates, they're sort of done. I could kill Hancock, but apparently Hancock, Bo is telling me that if I kill her, everybody stays in stone, the whole predicament. I'm going to do it anyways. And then we get a spark of Conker's hockey. I, I was just like, Girl, who could it be? The one and only Ray Lee. Ray Lee coming in. And it's funny hearing Ray Lee say, you know, I personally, you know, I don't like you. Like, it's one thing when pirates have beat, but for one of the, but Rayleigh, someone that's usually timid, calm, reserved, and it's always oh, comes at the perfect time to say, I really don't like you. It's like, oh man, he has a personal agenda. And at first, before eventually what happened, I'm like, can Rayleigh handle Blackbeard? Now, don't get me wrong, Rayleigh, we've seen it years ago. He was able to hold off against Kazaru, but I mean, Blackbeard confirming the fact that he has a basic level, uh, you know, basic understanding of hockey capabilities and two of the most overpowered devil fruits. Can he really survive Blackbeard? And I feel, I know I'm diving a little bit. One of the biggest drawbacks of Blackbeard when it comes to his power is just that it's so destructive. He's he just going to kill all his allies around him. I feel that's going to play a part in the future. But seeing Rayleigh come out and just, I was just like, man, this chapter, is, well, well, we're getting not just Blackbeard, but Rayleigh. We're getting Boa and we're getting these new pacifistas like, this is great. This is great. Eventually, Blackbeard ain't want no smoke with Rayleigh. He walks off, kidnaps Kobe, Boa, whatever, undoes the, undoes the stone for everybody. Undoes the stone. Unfreezes everybody from the stone. They go on with their day. And that's the most important thing I got out of that chapter. Following up with the next one, we get finally get more information as far as Sabo. What is Sabo trying to do? Is Sabo really... Kill the king. Now, I'm pretty sure we all know he did it. But having Sabo attempt to reach out to the revolution ar- revolutionary army to say, hey, M, not M, but that there's somebody that sits at the top. There's somebody that sits in a chair. There's somebody above the entire world to confirm that. And having M shoot down what I believe to be Uranus, what I believe to be the agent weapon, and destroy the island. You know, when you, when you know the strongest, when you understand that a character is overpowered, super strong, it's just like, all right, how strong are they? Until we really see it. Like this man, apparently king of the world, how strong is he? Obliterating an entire island. And then the, you know, 16, I was going to say streaks of lights or beams the same way as it's Enel. And a lot of parallels and comparisons to Skypea because Skypea is definitely a blueprint for this last saga. We're seeing the parallels with the attacks, with the moves, with the introduction to the grand scale of the attacks. Enel the same way, Beam, M the same way, Beam, how they both symbolize the king, the god, the rulers. And important things to note, what is the natural enemy of Enel or of his powers at least? Rubber, Luffy, who's going to be the natural enemy of M that, you know, we at some point Luffy's going to defeat him. Luffy, a.k.a. Sun God Nika. In- incredible stuff here. I-, I could continue fangirling and going on to more discussions as far as, yo, know, how this is all tying. And shout out to all the YouTubers that do all this hard research for me because I'd just be enjoying the theory videos like, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I'm not out here reading these covers, flipping these numbers and translations, but We're going to incorporate it. We're going to incorporate it. And then most recently, most recently, we're going to be talking about the Dr. Vegapunk revelation. For starters, it ain't an old man, at least for now. That's ridiculous. But One Piece chapter 1061, we could do like an official uh, review of this because this was recent. The Straw Hats, after slashing the tornado and finding that Bonnie was in there, the water spout, we get a giant shark at the bottom of the ocean and it ends up being a mecha shark. By the way, I'm loving the fact that the ocean and technology can still be a grand threat to not just a sun god, not just to the legendary straw hats. Oh yeah, we're saying legendary right now. But the fact that it isn't like, oh, we defeated Kaido, so now nothing could nothing could be, be an obstacle 
the ocean is still one of the greatest threats to any pirate with a devil fruit. Damn near, even without the devil fruit, the ocean is still something you don't play with. And having a mecha shark come out of nowhere, pretty sure nobody planned it. But to see that it was still a threat, something that was urgent and they had to overcome, it's nice to get that kind of urgency aside from, oh, a Yonka. I don't know. The ocean, yeah, the ocean's still pretty crazy, man. The ocean, what we got going on right now, it's still pretty wild. So, of course, the straw has been going overboard, Jimbe, having to save Luffy, Chopper, and Bonnie, everybody else. Who knows where they're at? So, we enjoyed our couple chapters of the straw hats getting together. So, we'll take a couple of steps back. I love the fact that we've been able to have some pre time skip Nakama engagement. The jokes, the interactions, Luffy, of course, getting in trouble for steering everybody wrong. And just, it feels, you know, it feels like the family again. We back together. We're, we were loving this. And it lasted for about, what, three, four chapters. And it was good, but, you know, it was, they was bound to separate again at some point for the sake of the story. So, Jembe, of course, saving Luffy, Chopper, Bonnie, Frankie in his mech suit, attempting to save everyone. And then eventually... The shark stops attacking. Come to find out. But by the way, Frankie, with your giant mech, that's a crazy, crazy on Frankie. But come to find out, and the mech suit is a person or in the shark. And it's no none other than the one and only Dr. Vegapunk. Yo, you know how... Re- like, it's one thing to go from finally having Mihawk. Okay, Crocodile, Crossgill, Buggy, Yonko, going from their Blackbeard. And Rayleigh and these pacifistas. And then from their M, Sabo, M unleashing his real, like, whether well, it's his power or weapon. And then to finally have, not finally, but then to add this on top, Dr. Vegapunk in the span of four chapters, we're seeing characters that we haven't seen fight in forever or more interaction that we ever seen, not just any, but like legendary characters. Mihawk, for like two chapters in a row, we've seen him talking and everything. Crazy. M. The final villain of One Piece, at least we assume. Actually, like, all right, it's time for me to throw hands. Like, we, you, y'all you, seen my underlings do the dirty work for me, but I'm going to show you what happens when I got to deal with stuff. Man, let me sit back. Let me sit back. Because that way they had me, had me going ballistic. And then this chapter, Dr. Vegapunk, the one that said, if we could say this or else I'm going to keep venting off about One Piece, man. Dr. Vegapunk being a female, a young female at that. Not, a, not, not an old man that we expected. Not the, you know, like, uh, uh, he's been doing this for years. He's barely, he's like a, a nerdy scientist. Nah. Dr. Vegapunk. Now, important thing to note that we see the zero two on the shirt. So could that be a second version of Dr. Vegapunk? Dr. Vegapunk's daughter? Who knows? But Carmen going off, it's like, huh, silly pirates. Y'all, y'all not my friends. I, I'm a Marine still, you know. So at the end of the day, whether I stop the shark or not, y'all are getting to work. Crazy. Uh, so that's a quick way to summarize, like about four weeks worth of One Piece that I have skipped out on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for then you guys not hearing my voice about this 